Chapter 4, Measures of Variability, Part 3. I'm going to talk more about variance and standard deviation in this video. In particular, we'll discuss how the mean and standard deviation are particularly useful in clarifying graphs of distributions. So within a graph, when we identify the mean and the standard deviation, those two data points alone give us a good sense of the distribution and also help us make comparisons when we are comparing two or more groups. We'll discuss in more detail this idea of bias and unbiased statistics. Briefly, bias indicating that um, the statistic that we are reporting is not reflective of all the values in a population. So our goal is to create unbiased statistics so that they are representative of the population from which they came. The means and standard deviations together provide extremely useful descriptive statistics for characterizing distributions. Don't forget that we are still in um, the process of understanding descriptive statistics. So it's just taking a distribution, either organizing it in a graph or summarizing it by using the mean and the standard deviation to understand um, what the entire distribution looks like. Again, the purpose of that is so that we can make comparisons. If we are engaging in an experiment, um, our goal is to determine if there is an effect of the independent variable that's being manipulated when we create these different conditions. For example, those who get the drug versus those who don't. And so we want to see if there's a mean difference um, let's say the amount of depression being uh, experienced by those who suffer from depression. Does the drug decrease depression? Is the average amount of depressive um, episodes decrease after taking the drug? So we can see that again the comparison is going to come down to is there a change in the means? And the standard deviation will help us better detect if those changes in the mean are due to the treatment or if they are as a result of random factors. So showing mean and standard deviation in the graph. So we can do this visually and um, um, describe a distribution in very simple terms for those who are consuming our research. For both population samples, it's easy to represent the mean and standard deviation. The vertical line in the center denotes the location of the mean, so that's going to be the average of all the scores in our distribution. The, then we can place a horizontal line from right to left, again on both sides from the mean, and that um, denotes the distance of one standard deviation. So when we talk about one standard deviation, whether it's a population, let's say it's equal to 10 points. Um, so again, 1 is equal to 10 points. So depending on the distribution, we can identify um, how many points one standard deviation is equal to. So visually, this is what we're talking about. So here we have a distribution, a normal distribution, symmetrical. In the center, we've identified the average score of that distribution. And now we've identified that one standard deviation is equal to 8 points. So if we were to go up one standard deviation unit, that would place us at an x value equal to, I'll give you a second to think about that, and if you said x is equal to 88, you'd be correct. So um, then if we go down one standard deviation unit, x would equal, and if you said 72, you'd be correct. And, and we'll learn um, beginning the next chapter and all uh, subsequent chapters, this idea of one standard deviation unit above and below is very important. Um, and what I can say right now is given the fact that this represents frequency, we can see that the highest peak uh, occurs or the highest frequency occurs within one standard deviation unit above and below. What that means is that the majority of the scores are similar to this mean of 80. They're centered around that score of 80. And um, the smaller the standard deviation, the closer or more consistent the scores are. The larger the standard deviation, the more inconsistent the, the scores are. So this, um, just using that same value of the mean of 80. See how it's flatter here? I've drawn it a little flatter because let's say the standard deviation was actually equal to 20. 
So if we went up one standard deviation unit, that would put us at a score of 100. And if we went down one standard deviation, that would put us at a score of 60. So you see that the range of scores is much larger than when the standard deviation is smaller. Here it was equal to 8. Here it's equal to 20. So again, this is visually conveying to us that this second distribution I just drew, this one, is um, more varied, has greater variability, therefore the standard deviation is larger, and um, it's, as we'll learn, a little harder to detect differences when we're comparing means. When we have smaller standard deviation, we have a higher peak in the center. It's a little easier to see differences when we're comparing two or more groups of distributions. Um, in a histogram, this is how we would denote the mean here in the center. So we have a sample um, being displayed here because m is equal to 16. So that tells us we're working with a sample. And s equal to 2 indicates that on average, again, on, by definition, the standard deviation indicates that on average, the scores in all these, um, in this distribution, deviate or differ from the mean of this distribution by two points. So again, the mean is 16, and we have um, scores of 18, 17, 15, and 13. Obviously, 13 is not equal to 16, 15 is not equal to 16, um, 17 is not equal to 16, 18 is not equal to 17, and what S equal to 2 is illustrating is that on average, these scores deviate from the mean by two points. Um, so it gives us a sense of the variation and also the consistency of the scores in the distribution. So a little bit more about this idea of bias and unbiased statistics. So sample variance as an unbiased statistic. So unbiased estimate of a population parameter. If we were to take all possible samples from a population, and we'll get into this idea that theoretically we're going to do this, but if we assume that all samples have been selected from a population and we calculate the mean of all of those samples, the average value of, stati average value of statistic is equal to parameter. So again, we learn that a statistic is in reference to a value coming from a sample. A population is a value coming from the, excuse me, a parameter is coming from a population. So what we're indicating here is that when we're talking about the mean of a sample and we consider all possible samples, the average of all those sample means will always equal the population mean. And the reason is that all samples are coming from that population, so all values are taken into consideration when we're calculating the mean of the sample means. This will become a lot clearer when we um, engage in chapters 5 and 6 when we're looking at the normal distribution and a distribution of sample means. But for now, just understand that if we were to take all samples um, from a population and averaged all the sample means, the average of all those sample means would equal the population mean. And that's what we're saying here. And the average value uses all possible samples of a particular size. So n equal to, it could be n equal to 100, n equal to 50. But if they're all consistent and we take all possible samples from the population, the average of those sample means will equal the population mean. It's not the, the same, though, when we're talking about the variability of a sample or the variability of all sample means coming from a population. So we have the corrected standard deviation formula dividing by n minus 1. Again, we've learned that n minus 1 is the same as degrees of freedom. And this produces an unbiased estimate of the population variance. And I'll show you a slide in just a moment um, to illustrate this concept of what happens if we don't divide by n minus 1 when we're calculating variance. Again, variance is equal to the sum of squared deviations over n for population. But if we're working with the sample, we recognize that the equation is sum of squared deviations over n minus 1. And again, the purpose of dividing by n one minus 1 is so that we produce an unbiased estimate of the population variance. 
bias estimate of a population parameter systematically overestimates or underestimates the population parameter. So if, for example, we were to do this mathematically, take the sum of all square deviations divided by n, what we would do is produce a, a value that under estimates or overestimates. Um, normally it's more in the case that it underestimates the variability of the population. And we want our sample statistics to be as close to the populations, um, population parameters as possible so that um, we are able to engage in inferential statistics, which means that we're using sample statistics to draw conclusions about the population. So if our sample statistics aren't in line with our population parameters, then our conclusions are, are um, misleading and inaccurate. So Table 4.1 helps us better understand these concepts of the average of sample averages or the average of sample means will equal the population mean but a correction is necessary to produce unbiased um, statistics of the variance that will then also lead to unbiased statistics for the standard deviation. So table 4.1 follows the example 4.7 in our text which is um, which begins on page 105 and continues on to page 106. So um, you can follow along to under better understand this so I'll um, describe what we're looking at here. So what we have here, this column indicates that we've taken nine samples from a population. And the first score, so if we take to, into consideration the first sample, my first x is equal to zero and my second x is equal to zero. So if I compute the average of those two scores, again it would be zero plus zero, right, divided by two and I get an average score of zero. Um, let's take the seventh sample, actually let's take uh, the sample, the eighth sample. So the eighth sample that I select, my first score is equal to 9, my second score is equal to 3. So the average of those two scores, 9 plus 3, divide by 2, so 12 divide by 2 and I get an average of 6. So we do that for all nine samples and what we produce here is unbiased mean. Um, that we've, we've calculated the mean for each of those samples. And if we take into consideration that these are all the possible samples from a particular population and we average all of those unbiased mean statistics, again what, what I'm saying is if we take the average of these values here, so we take the sum of all this, these columns here, the total is equal to 36. And if I were to take the average of all possible sample means, so I have nine samples, so 36 divided by nine, and, and this is where I am here, so the mean of nine unbiased sample mean estimates, 36 divided by nine gives us four. And we're, we're told here in parentheses that the actual population mean is equal to four. So notice that they're equivalent to one another. So again, what we're saying is that if we take all possible samples, calculate the mean for each sample, and average all of those sample means, it will equal the population mean. So that's why it's unbiased, because they're equivalent to one another. The mean of sample means will always equal the population mean. Now let's consider what happens if we calculate the variance without engaging in that mathematical correction. So again, variance of a sample is equal to sum of square deviations divided by n minus 1. But let's say instead of engaging in that mathematical correction, we just do sum of square deviations divided by n. So now again, we, we consider all of our samples. We have nine samples. These are the scores. Score score 1, score 2 for all of the samples and this column here represents the calculations for the variance. Now if you want to follow along in the text um, and actually do the mathematical calculations I, I highly encourage you to do that. I don't want to spend the time doing that here because the purpose of this slide is just to show you what happens if we don't engage in that mathematical correction. 
So this column was produced by using this equation. Variance is equal to SS divided by N, not um, using the proper equation of N minus 1. So by doing so, we've created this column of these variances for each of these nine samples. The sum of the variances that were calculated is equal to 63. So now let's consider the average of the bias sample variance. So the mean of the nine bias sample variances estimates estimates is equal to 63 divided by 9. So we get a sample statistic of 7, meaning that this is the average sample variance for all nine samples. But the actual population variance is equal to 14. So they're not equal, and that's why we refer to that process as being biased. It's biased because it's not producing a value of a sample statistic that's equivalent to the population parameter. So our correction, again, is to utilize the accurate um, equation of variance is equal to SS over N minus 1. So when we use that equation and we consider the sample of nine different samples and each score, so again, the sample size, not to forget that each sample size is equal to two. So we have two scores for each of these nine samples. And now if we calculate variance using this equation, the actual correct unbiased equation that you uses n minus one as the denominator, then we produce these values, what we refer to as the unbiased variance. And we do that for all nine samples. And the sum of these sample variances is equal to 126. So down here it says the mean of the nine unbiased sample variance estimates is equal to 126. Divide by how many we have. We have nine samples, and that's equal to 14. And then it's, it indicates that the actual population variance is equal to 14. So they're equivalent, and that's why we refer to that as unbiased, that the sample statistic is equal to the population parameter. And it's only equal because we engaged in this mathematical correction where we divide by n minus 1, or degrees of freedom, opposed to simply just n. So again, I, I encourage you to calculate the variance, maybe just of one or two of these, to confirm um, the values that you see using the incorrect biased equation and the correct unbiased equation, just to for your purposes of, of affirming that these numbers are accurate. But again, the purpose of this slide is to show you that when we do not use the proper equation, it leads us to values that are not equivalent to the population. And that is why we would refer to it as a biased statistic. And we want unbiased statistics. So again, the reason we divide by n minus 1 is so that we produce sample statistics that are equal to the population parameters. So just to review the standard deviation and descriptive statistics, the standard deviation describes scores in terms of distance from the mean. More precisely, it's the average difference between the scores and the mean, or the average distance between a score and the mean of that particular distribution. Um, it describes an entire distribution with just two numbers, the mean and the standard deviation. When we use the mean and standard deviation, it conveys or describes the whole distribution for us very easily and also helps us make comparison between conditions or different groups um, that we're engaging in research with. Reference to both allows reconstruction of the measurement scale from just these two numbers. So for example, here we have figure 4.7. The sample size is equal to 20 individuals. The average of this particular sample is equal to 36, and the standard deviation is equal to 4. So again, We've identified the center of the distribution using the mean of the sample. And then S is equal to 4. Again, what, we're what that indicates or conveys is that the scores in this distribution differ from the mean by 
an average of four points. So again, we have a score here of 43 and 45 and a score of 28. Again, that's, um, they deviate, you know, score of 28 or score of 31, they deviate a certain amount by the average of 36, the mean deviation, x minus m, a certain amount. But standard deviation combines all of those differences and then presents an average. So on average, all of the scores in this distribution deviate from the mean of 36 by four points. And again, it's, um, very helpful in understanding where the majority of the scores are going to reside. Again, going up four standard deviation, excuse me, four points or one standard deviation unit above the mean takes us to a score of 40. Going below takes us to a score of 32. And notice that that's where the majority of the scores in the distribution reside. So that will be important when we talk about the probability of a value occurring in the distribution. So if we were to say that, um, what is the probability of a score of 45 occurring? Well, that's out here in the tail, so it has low probability. The probability of a score of 28 occurring, also low because it's outside of that um, main area where the highest frequency occurs. The probability of a score of 38 occurring, quite high because it's very close to the mean of 36. So we'll use this information to better understand probability when we get to chapter six. In chapter three, I presented um, the rules of transforming a distribution when we're adding and uh, subtracting and multiplying and dividing by a constant. So here's a, um, a brief summary. When we add a constant to each score, and this also applies adding or subtracting a constant from each score and multiplying or dividing each score by a constant. So our rules, again, just to review, I've pre presented this in a previous um, lecture. The mean, the new mean, is equal to the original mean plus or minus the constant. And I showed you a slide where, you know, if we add um, a value to every score, the same value to every score, then we expect the mean to change because the sum of x is going to change. And we don't need to know what all the x values are to determine the effects on the mean. All we need to understand is the rule that if we add the exact same value to every score, the mean is going to increase that in that same manner, or if we subtract a score. In terms of the variability, the new standard deviation will equal the original, and I had shown you a slide that if we added five points to a score, um, the, the spread between scores was not affected. Similar if you subtract a constant, the spread between scores is not going to change. The spread between scores is reflective of the variance, the variability, or the standard deviation of a distribution. When we multiply, so um, when we multiply or divide by a constant, the new mean will equal the original, right? Multiplied or divided by a constant. So similar, again, we expect the change, the mean to change because the scores are changing. And unlike what happens when we add or subtract a constant, the new mean does change when we multiply or divide by a constant. And the reason is that the spread between scores um, changes. So if we multiply by a constant, the spread increases. If we divide by a constant, the spread decreases. But um, in both cases, the spread between scores is affected, so therefore the variability changes. So we'll be um, looking at examples that use these rules. And again, we don't need to know all the x values to, to determine the effects on the mean the standard deviation. All we need to use is these rules to um, calculate the new mean and the new standard deviation. So as I indicated earlier, variance um, is very useful in, in when we engage in inferential statistics. So the goal of inferential statistics is to detect meaningful and significant patterns in research results. So again, if we're comparing um, two groups, 
one group that receives the drug and one group that doesn't receive the drug, what we want to assess first is a difference in the mean. So we're hoping for a large mean difference but also the variation that exists within each of these groups will help us determine if we, if we do see a change in the mean, it'll be easier to determine that that change was due to the treatment when variability is low opposed to when variability is large. So low variability helps us better detect differences, meaningful significant patterns um, between groups that are being compared. So variability in the data influences how easy it is to see patterns. So similar to what I just said, high variability obscures, makes it harder um, to see these differences. Um, and variability, low variability makes it easier to see these differences. So variability is, uh, is sometimes referred to as error variant. So um, when there's great variability and the differences between groups um, is not easy to detect. That's sometimes just referred to as error variance, that changes are simply due to chance and are reflective of the variance, the original variance that existed before we engaged in this research or before we exposed these groups to um, different conditions of the independent variable. So here is a visual of, of what I'm trying to convey to you. So experiments with high and low variability. So data, um, the data for experiment A, let's say that this is um, in relation to treatment for depression. And we have a group of individuals um, before treatment, those in the blue here. So before treatment, on average, they experience 40 episodes of depression each week. So this is this average of 40, right, comes from this, this part of the distribution. Um, the individuals in our um, sample, it's a quite, quite a small sample, but nonetheless, this is the average. And then we give them um, a new drug, a new antidepressant drug. So again, what we're saying, on average, this group, this sample of four individuals, experiences 40 episodes of depression per week. They receive the drug and then we measure on average how much depression or de um, episodes of depression they experience per week. And in white we see that now their depression, their average depression has decreased and the average is 35. So we see a five point decrease and that's good, right? It, it appears that the um, depression was uh, decreased and was affected by treatment receiving this drug. In the original um, sample, the blue distribution, the average of 40 was very reflective of the variation of depression experienced by all individuals. So one individual had 39, another one 41, and the other two were right there in the center of 40. So in other words, that mean of 40 was very representative of all of the scores because there's low variability. There's low variability. They look very similar to the mean. And that variability is consistent because we, we're working with the same individuals, so the variability in this distribution, the white distribution, is similar because it's the same individuals low variability and now again now we're looking at the mean difference so again the average amount of depression experience so because there's low variability you can eat more easily detect these differences between groups because the variation in depression does not extend into these values of 33, and, um, 34, 35, 36. They're, they're completely separate. So when we see the whole distribution move, it gives us a sense that the treatment was effective. However, if the distribution looked like this in experiment B, let's say we're still working with individuals who suffer from depression, and the blue values represent this, the individuals in the sample before um, treatment and again their average level of depression was equal to 40 but notice one person experiences 60 episodes of depression another 20 and we understand that there is great variation in the amount of depression of those um, one two three four individuals in our sample so great variation to begin with 
And nonetheless, the average is equal to 40. So the average amount of depression is equal to 40. So in contrast, so this group of blue individuals here, in contrast to that group, we, we conclude that there's much higher variability here in the second um, graph. And therefore, the standard deviation of this distribution would be much higher than in the first distribution. So again, we expose um, these individuals to treatment. So again, before treatment, their scores are denoted in blue values. Now after treatment, on average, they experience 35 episodes of depression. So again, still a five point decrease, which is great. But notice that even now in this, um, again, we're working with the same individual, so the variability is still pretty inconsistent. So the range is somewhere between, I don't know, that's like 12 and 58, perhaps. So there's great variation, but on average, now they're experiencing 35 episodes of depression per week opposed to 40. So there was a decrease on average but notice that the variability of the distributions makes it harder to, con to conclude that the difference is due to treatment. It may just be due to the variation that exists um, to begin with. Um, so again, the span of scores from here to here, right, is quite varied. And now we're looking at uh, um, the span from here to here. So they overlap that variability overlaps and the scores overlap. So it's very hard to detect whether or not the difference in average level of depression is due to treatment. Whereas here in this first graph, we don't have any overlap in variability. They're completely separate. So hopefully this gives you a sense of the purpose and function of, of reporting, calculating and reporting measures of variability low variability is going to help reveal differences much easier than when we have high variability to begin with. So just a side note, the researcher is always hoping for large mean difference, right? We would hope that the amount of depression doesn't equal the amount of depression before treatment. We hope that after treatment there's a big difference in the average amount of depression experienced once they receive treatment. So the researcher hopes for large mean difference and low variability. Large mean difference and low variability. Those two things um, combined will um, produce the most effective research conclusions. Um, when where there's high variability, the, the conclusions are convoluted by the variation, the, the differences that already exist. So it's hard to pinpoint why we see a difference of five points. Again, we're, we're left with um, drawing the conclusion that it's due to treatment or it's due to random factors. And because the variability is so high, the likelihood that it's due to random factors is much higher than, than it would be um, due to the treatment that was exposed um, or used to um, decrease depression in this case. So here's a, a learning check that we'll end with. A population has a mu of, or the mu equal to six, the average is equal to six, and standard deviation is equal to two. Again, the average represents um, the occurrences of all scores in a distribution. That's the average, it's summarizing the distribution. Standard deviation conveys that on average, the scores in the distribution deviate from the score of six by two points. Each score is multiplied by 10, so the fact that we did it to each score means that it's a constant. And uh, what is the shape of the resulting distribution? So the mean, the new mean, let's use our um, rules. The new will equal the original multiplied by the constant. So the new mean is equal to the original. The original is equal to, and let me change my notation because in this case we're using the mu population to be consistent here. So the new mu um, is equal to the original, which was 6, multiplied by the constant, which is um, 10. So we have a new mu of 60. 
Now, what did we learn about standard deviation? So the new, when we multiply and divide, it's equal to the original, the original multiplied by the constant. So we do see a change in variation. And um, so we can answer this by replacing variables. So the original standard deviation was equal to 2. We multiplied all scores by a constant of 10. So the new standard deviation of the population is equal to 20. And I may have said mu just a second ago and what I meant with standard deviation. So the new standard deviation of the population is equal to the original multiplied by the constant. So the new standard deviation is equal to 2 times 10 and we get 20. Therefore our answer is 60 and 20 and our answer would, would be C. And now some true or false statements. Um, true or false, a bias statistic has been influenced by research error. And the answer is false. The bias um, element of a statistic is coming from the fact that it doesn't include all the scores that are reflected in a population. True or false, on average, unbiased sample statistics have the same value as a population parameter. So I walked you through that slide showing that if we calculate unbiased statistics, then the sample statistic will equal the population parameter, which is our goal in inferential statistics. So here's an expansion of those responses. So the first one is false. Bias refers to the systematic error of using sample data to estimate population parameter. And it's not uh, reflective of, of researcher error. It's just due to the fact that samples aren't always going to be inclusive of the extremes that are expressed in the population. And the second one was true. Each sample's a statistic differs from the population parameter, but the average of overall samples will equal the population um, parameter. So as long as we um, take the average of all sample means, we'll e that will equal the population um, mean or the mu. And when it comes to variance, as long as we engage in the proper equation, right, the unbiased uh, process of computing variance, then that will equal the population parameter or the population variance. And I'll end with a, a printout. Um, some of SPSS, which is a statistical application used in uh, the behavioral sciences. And this is just a output of what you would see. So here we, we show that our sample size is equal to eight. The range is equal to eight, which means that the minimum score, right, um, and the maximum score, so the minimum, maximum minus the minimum is equal to eight. Um, the mean is 6.5 for that distribution, and the standard deviation is 2.61. Um, what we would read that as is that the scores in the distribution deviate from the mean of 6.5 by 2.62 if we round points. So there's, there's um, great consistency in this distribution because the, the average difference between the scores and the mean is only equal to 2.62 points. And the variance, um, again, how are these related? Well, if we have standard deviation to get the variance, we would just square that value um, because we know that when we calculate variance, variance is a standard deviation is the square root um, of our variance. So if we work backwards. If we have standard deviation, we just square it, and that produces our variance. And by definition, variance is the average of squared deviations, the average of squared deviations. And that's it for this um, last lecture for Chapter 4. Um, please take time to do the learning checks while you're reading and take notes when you're watching these lecture videos um, so that you master material before we move on to the next chapter.